Good morning. I want to welcome everyone who is here for the Climate Change in You, What Can a Gardener Do Now presentation. I'm Kim Wetzel Williams, one of the Wyandotte County Extension Master Gardeners. Our speaker today is Frank Riley. He is a senior consultant with the Logist, excuse me, with the Logistics Management Institute. And he is an environmental scientist specializing in environmental assessments. In the past 10 years, he has focused on climate impact prediction and assessment, particularly the best practices for both mitigation and adaptation to climate change based risks. He is a master gardener for over 20 years, and he originally presented this class uh, at the International Master Gardener Conference last September. He has graciously adapted portions of his talk to address some of the greatest concerns in our Kansas City or Central U.S. Uh, region. So at this time, I will turn it over to Francis Riley. Thank you, Kim. So, um, I I have started talking about climate change about 15 years ago, uh, but most of my talks were about the risks that people hadn't thought about. And I, I, you know, everybody left the room feeling uh, horrible, like the end is near. And I, I realized that that's really not the thing to do. And, and what I've been doing in my day job has been uh, to help, um, um, has been to try and help some uh, federal clients react to climate change. So uh, Logistics Management Institute started off as a not-for-profit organization um, to service uh, better government. So we, we work with a lot of agencies on a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things that we do is um, uh, various infrastructure projects. So about uh, 13 years ago, I got asked to participate in a project called um, uh, a federal manager's guide to climate change. Uh, because at that time, everybody thought that climate change just meant, well, it's going to get it a half a degree warmer. What could that possibly mean? And uh, it turns out that it can mean a lot of different things. So um, I started doing that, and um, I, I, I was interested in infrastructural challenges. And one of the things I deal with uh, is... Um, water resources. So the Army asked me to do um, um, a water footprint. So if you're familiar with the term carbon footprint, you know, how much carbon does it take for you to, to fly from Kansas City to Newark? Um, that, that's the kind of thing you do. And a footprint is, uh, you know, how much uh, carbon for each one of those steps, um, how much carbon went into your luggage, how much carbon, you know, went into your uh, meal preparation for on the flight, how much went into the, the fuel that's used, uh, how much went into making the, the water bottle that you drank. And um, a water footprint is just the same thing, only instead of carbon, water. And one of the things we found out was that uh, over 85% of the water that the Army needs to be ready um, was being used for um, things that we didn't think of as water. It wasn't for washing off tanks or drinking or uh, for soldiers to shower. It was for things like manufacturing to get uh, bullets to the troops um, to, make, uh, to make the fuel uh, that is used by the tanks. And um, the Army was so interested in that that they commissioned me to do another study called Water Vulnerability Studies. While I was doing that, um, I was looking at, you know, what could happen in the supply chain if there was flooding or what could happen in the supply chain if there was a uh, um, drought. And I could not consider any of that without considering what the possibilities were for climate change. And that led us uh, to another book from LMI, um, you know, what can you do now? And the idea there was we, we invented the concept of climate change users, who, who is affected by climate change, they're a user of it. And we wanted to make some specific recommendations um, what are the things you can do to uh, mitigate against climate change? And what are the things you can do to adapt to the effects of climate change? That's when my brain started working uh, on the master gardener side of the house. And I thought, oh, well, I should be doing that. I should be talking to master gardeners about what they can uh, tell their clients, uh, the, you know, the gardeners and the public to do to get by with climate change. And when I started being a master gardener, 
nine of every 10 questions I ever got asked were about the grass. And uh, I know most moster gardeners hate grass. Uh, they, they do it, you know, it's a, I'm quoted as saying uh, turf is a, a perfectly good waste of gardening space. Um, and so um, I, I've noticed over the years that um, more and more of the number of questions I get asked really have to do with climate change. Um, you know, what about how, what am I going to do about all this water that I'm not used to having in my garden? What am I going to do about the fact that there's a drought this year? We've never had a drought in June before. And so I started to prepare some talks that go like the one today. Today's talk is adapted from the one I did at the International Master Gardener Conference. Um, it's not the same. I tried to make it uh, a little bit home for you um, Kansas folks. And uh, so while I'm saying Kansas, let me just say congratulations on uh, your national championships. I, my heart was broken on Monday because I am a Tar Heels fan, but uh, congratulations. It was a great game and a great effort. Um, one of the things that we did for the military and for other agencies are safety strategies. What happens with climate change that, um, that we can do something about? So I'm going to focus on gardens in our communities, but I want to I want you to see how I got the ideas. So um, one of the things that we did, this was a study that we did for for the um, uh, military about the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, and what we did what we did was look at some things like temperature extremes. If it's too hot, planes can't take off. Uh, if it's too hot men can't work outside on the planes. If it's too hot, women can't work outside on the uh, uh, on keeping the tarmac open. Um, we looked at storm damage, uh, coastal flooding, drought, tropical cyclones like hurricanes, and wildfire damage. Um, we worked together with a group called the, uh, uh, the Climate Service that has some great models where you can ask specific questions. What are the possibilities of there being um, uh, extra moisture at a specific place um, in, a, in, in the 2020s, in the 2040s. And so we estimated this stuff through um, the end of the century, through 2090, and uh, for each of several places where F-35s are. And so the bars are all the risk. So all the risk, the way we picked it to um, assess it for the the government was, you know, what what's the chance of not being open for business today? So the Army and the Air Force and the Navy, I mean, their job is to be ready to um, uh, defend our nation's interests. And so um, on any given day, they they measure their success rate by mission readiness is are you know, are the troops ready to go? Can they do what they're paid to do? And so each of these bar graphs are, you know, the number of um, days in percents that they would not be willing to go, be ready to go. And different locations have different reasons for risk. So here's like Joint Base Iwakuna, their increasing risk um, through the decades is due to flooding, coastal flooding. Um, whereas, uh, um, at Eglin Air Base, um, theirs is by increases in storms. All of them have increases in temperature. Um, some places, the increase in temperature risk, how much damage can be caused to the schedule by risk, is, um, is by increased temperature. Now, that's kind of a confusing thing because, in fact, temperature is what's driving all of those other risks. So, uh, so the you know the higher the average temperature, the more chance there is of having a severe storm. Okay, so what are the effects of climate change? Now, everybody's been talking about global warming since that's what they started off calling it, and of course that's where all the jokes always come up. You know, when it's when it's snowing in April, somebody says, "Oh yeah, how about that global warming?" And um, the fact is that um, warmer temperatures are what is causing things to happen like snow in April. It's really climate change more than it's global warming, but it's caused by global warming. And what that means is uh, for you, we're gardeners, so more frost-free days. That's a good thing. Maybe you can grow a different uh, strain of pumpkin than you're used to growing. Maybe even sweet potatoes. Um, it means higher heat and cold zone ratings. You know those USDA uh, rating maps? 
you're going to find that you'll be able to grow some of the stuff that you only dreamed about before. I was able to grow artichokes outside in Virginia um, uh, year after year when the uh, USDA maps say, you know, clearly it won't grow here because too cold in winter. Um, it means there's going to be higher maximum temperatures, but the higher maximum temperatures is not that big a deal like for human comfort, a half a degree, two degrees. I mean, I can stand that or I can go inside, but, um, but half a degree or two degrees outside temperatures really changes a lot of other things. Um, and uh, more importantly, there's going to be higher minimum temperatures. So in the winter, you might not get enough hard freezes to kill certain pests, or you might not have it be cold enough long enough to get snowpack in the parts of the country where the snow is the predominant source of moisture. It snows all winter and the snow gradually melts through the growing season in the summer, and that's where they get their, mo their moisture, like Colorado. Um, so, so the warmer temperatures is going to cause variable weather and it's going to cause warmer winters. So variable weather means increased storms. And that's going to be not just the, the increase in the number of storms, but the increase in the severity of the storms. Um, when it's warmer, uh, then, then the moisture in the air can rise higher up in the atmosphere. And that means when it turns into hail, it falls from a higher temperature. So it's from, excuse me, from a higher um, altitude. So it, you know, picks up more moisture, becomes bigger hail with more force. Um, the winds that are generated by uh, thunderclouds are going to be um, much higher because the thunderclouds can reach much higher into the sky. So um, that means that we can expect more hurricanes and tornadoes. And I'm sure nobody ever heard the word derecho before about 10 years ago, but now we've all had one. And so that straight line winds, um, that's clearly um, a weather pattern that we're not used to having in the, um, you know, temperate zone in the northern hemisphere. Um, warmer winters means less snow, um, and it could be more rain or less rain. And one of the problems is it could mean the exact same amount of rain, but that it comes um, in big amounts with big dry spells in between. So we're going to see sort of a uncoupling of the kind of rain events that we're used to. Whereas, you know, if, if you're just a physicist and you're out there just measuring the buckets of rain that fell, the same number. Uh, but since they, um, they uh, if you're like in Colorado, they all fell as rain in the winter and fell off the mountain in the winter, that means there's no moisture left for summer for growing. So, so when the rain falls and how much falls at once is a big deal. Warmer winters means more success for some kinds of pests. So corn earworm, for example, is an animal that, uh, that is controlled mainly by having cold winters. Uh, if there's not uh, 12 degrees, uh, 12 days consecutive without a freeze, then the corn earworm can overwinter. And so it's not the eggs that overwinter. That means you get more generations of the pest. Um, it means more stress for some natives. Your native plant palate is going to change. Um, your uh, plant, plant palate, like, you know, your grandma's favorite bush or tree that you always grew, might start to be less hardy now, be more susceptible to pests, to see different pests. And one of the things I'm truly worried about is a loss of synchrony. So, so what happens if uh, the trees are in bloom and the pollinators aren't there because they're still co too cold to come around? Um, rising sea level is not that big a deal in Kansas, in Kansas, but it is a big deal for stuff that goes into Kansas, like your food from, that comes from other kinds of places. It's going to mean saltier water and lost land. Um, I am going to brush by some of this stuff. I think some of you people may want to, you know, retire someday and move to the beach, so it's still in there, but I'm just going to fly by it. Okay, so the approach that we used in that LMI climate book was ways to mitigate climate change. Um, mitigate climate change are things that you can do to sort of halt climate change or decrease the amount of climate change. So what we're talking about here is greenhouse gases. So anything you can do to uh, not generate more greenhouse gases or to um, hide more greenhouse gases from the atmosphere is a good thing to do. Carbon is the big one, carbon dioxide. And this is the one that causes all the political strife. So, you know, when certain people that are very, very earnest about their, um, uh, their climate change are saying, yeah, you know, get rid of your cars. We can have no more cars. We should have no more fossil fuel whatsoever. 
Well, that's really a non-starter in the United States. And it's why a bunch of people grows up and, um, you know, are basically promulgating a lot of lies about uh, carbon and climate change and saying that there is no climate change. It's clear that there's climate change. There's no doubt that there's climate change. All the measurements show that there's climate change. But if you repeat a lie often enough, uh, people start to believe it. So mitigating climate change is about somehow getting carbon dioxide out of the air. You can do that by minimizing the amount of fossil fuels you use by driving an electric car or using an electric lawnmower um, or by driving less or using less lawnmowers or by doing things that soak up the carbon, like planting more things. And since I'm talking to gardeners and master gardeners, I think I hit the sweet spot here. Almost all the stuff we do actually helps mitigate climate change in a non really political way. I mean, who's against planting more stuff? Um, the other thing is ways to adapt to the challenges. And when you talk about climate change, uh, mitigate means to try and stop climate change. Adapt means what do you do to survive the risks and the increased damage from climate change? I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about adapting to climate change, but the fact is almost everything gardeners do to adapt to climate change helps to mitigate climate change. So this is the bottom line up front. Uh, what can you do to adapt to climate change? The first thing you can do is be prepared. What does be prepared mean? Assess your risks. So after the talk today, hopefully you can think about what climate change stuff could go on in your actual space, in your yard and in your community. And, you know, what's the real risk of it? And then um, be observant. See if it's happening. Is any of this stuff starting to happen? Um, there's early warning signs that you can look for that master gardeners are out there and they see more often than, than regular gardeners. Um, be vigilant. Look often and early. Uh, as master gardeners, I'm pretty sure that you've worked a hoard helpline sometime and uh, heard somebody say that their tree died overnight. Uh, no trees die overnight. Even if they get struck by lightning, they're not dead overnight. They take a long time to die. And anybody who tells you that something in gardening happened overnight is somebody who is not out there scouting, looking often and early. So getting out there and looking often and early and warning the public about it, that's, that's exactly what our sweet spot is. So be adaptable. I'm going to have some actual hints here. What can you use that will work? And I want you to understand that there's some things that you used to do that may no longer work. Participate. So master gardeners do educational work. So share your experience and your knowledge across the fence and at the supermarket and uh, in your classes that you offer the public uh, to your friends. Um, be a gardener. Be, being a gardener really helps with these things. Um, being a master gardener helps you explain why you're doing the things you're doing in your garden and the things that can really help. And vote. So I already uh, threw the gauntlet down about... Um, you know, what I feel about people telling lies about climate change, I think, you know, voting means not allowing lies to go forward. It doesn't mean, you know, being a, a complete a granola snapper and, you know, never do this and being, uh, being a total uh, jerk about it. But it does mean that, you know, when the city council uh, is wondering whether they should spend some money on a, a green space, you should be out there saying, I think we should spend some money on the green space because green space is good for climate change and it's good for the people. If it's talking about planting street trees, get out there and say, I want street trees because these things are good for climate change. Okay. So how do you assess the risk? So just a little bit about risk assessment. Risk assessment always has to do with um, the probability of something occurring and how bad it can be if it does happen. So um, it's probable that there can be some water supply contamination by a spill or by you know, flooding or something. And the consequence is kind of high. OK, water supply means, you know, boil alerts or something like that. Heat waves can be um, not a big deal if it's a short heat wave, but a heat wave that lasts more than several days can be um, a real human health aspect. Let's talk about flooding in particular. So flooding, the probability of flooding during climate change is going to increase, increased amounts of flooding, okay? If you, um, if you um, adapt to the flooding by climate change, you're doing things to see that the flooding doesn't hurt you. If you mitigate climate change, that is going to 
decrease the probability and the severity of the risk. Okay, so think about your risks like, uh, you know, your, the risk of being out in your yard mowing the grass and getting hit by a meteor. Well, the consequences are really high but the probability is really low. So, um, so, so that's the way to start thinking about things, to put things in perspective and spend your money in the right place. Okay, so what kind of adaptations? Sea level rise is one uh, that we're hearing about. And um, the kinds of things that you know, big government can do is put in tide gates and barriers, levees, uh, and some examples, like the, uh, the, the tidal gates out in the Venetian Lagoon are finally going in. It's taken them 20 years to do it. It's billions of dollars of infrastructure. Um, and it may or may not be enough uh, to keep the water out of St. Mark's uh, Square. In the Netherlands, the, um, the Delta Works is a combination of the dikes, which are much more sophisticated than when the little boy put his finger in the dike, and pumps. But they're all prepared there for a 10,000-year flood protection. Well, so the flood that could occur is one in 10,000 years. It's not likely to occur very often, you know, kind of low probability. But when it happens, it, you know, the Netherlands is the lowlands. It floods a third of their country. So the consequences are very high. So they're willing to spend a lot of money to do it. Okay. So let's talk about specifics. Turf is one of the things that most master gardeners get asked the most questions about. Whenever I talk about master gardeners, I like to talk about how popular we are, because when you're at a cocktail party, uh, you're like even more, even more popular than a pediatrician. And then I tell them, uh, but you know, all the questions are about the grass, so you better pay attention in the grass class. Um, turf, um, the kinds of things that are going to happen with turf are uh, changes in moisture. There can be uh, too much moisture if it rains all at once and it can, you know, rot your grass or too little, um, which you're probably used to too little in the end of the summer there. But we're going to have times of the year now where there's too little in an important time of the year, maybe in the spring. That's the problem. There's going to be inconsistency in the amount of moisture. It's going to fall at the wrong time. So um, changes in temperature. Uh, there's going to be changes in temperature that may be a good thing for turf grass, but may be a bad thing. We don't know. There's going to be new and more pests. Um, um, so what can you do about turf? Um, one thing to do is consider less turf because uh, turf is kind of, you know, not that good at making carbon go into the soil. And it requires mowing. So you're going to use probably fossil fuels or at least electricity that may have been generated by fossil fuels to do it. Um, consider changing varieties. Uh, that's something that I'll talk about in just a minute, but uh, there are some varieties of turf that require far less uh, care. Uh, the best thing you can do um, as gardeners in Kansas and master gardeners in Kansas is keep up with what uh, Kansas State Agricultural Experiment Station says about turf. Um, they they have a number of uh, documents online there at the at the uh, URL that's on the bottom of this slide that um, that talk about uh, the kinds of turf that they've been testing and that they've been working on. Um, one of the things that you have to worry about is the hundredth meridian. So when I was uh, writing the, the book about what can you do about turf. I um, was proposing uh, one particular thing to do that I'll show you a picture of later on in the talk. And when I got some of my friends in uh, Texas at the Agricultural um, uh, uh, Resource Centers to look at it, they said, nobody's going to do that because there's not enough water to do it. Um, one of the things in farming is west of the 100th meridian, you almost certainly have to use some irrigation or consider dry land farming techniques. Um, in Missouri, What's going to happen is that the uh, the effects of the hundredth meridian um, are moving east. So there's going to be less and less rainfall closer and closer to you folks in Wyandotte County, and um, that's that's something to look forward to. Um, considering maybe varieties of turf that require less irrigation, like uh, warm season varieties, or, or um, or no turf at all, or you know, far less turf, and and other kinds of plants that are you know more is more happy with xeriscaping. This is a uh, 
this is a turf grass map from a long time ago uh, it shows what uh, cooperative extensions across the country you used to say about growing grass in the northern zone um, it was it was you should only and always grow cool season grasses like fescue and bluegrass and ryegrass and in the southern zone you should always and only grow warm season grasses like uh, zoysia and centipede um, in the transitional zone um, here's the propaganda they used to say that meant you could easily grow either kind what it really meant was it's difficult to grow either kind but what i can tell you is uh, you know you folks are at the edge of the transitional zone in this ancient map which is changing okay so um so i'm not sure what your agent tells you about what uh, kind of grass to plant but i don't think i'm telling any lies if i tell you that you should probably start to consider some warm season grasses as being more successful in uh, your neck of the woods you're on the edge but here's the point about climate change is the edge is moving northward so I'm very familiar with this prospect in uh, Virginia, where I'm from. I, I teach turf all over. This line do, definitely includes all of Virginia now. There's, there's no place here, all the way up here in Loudoun County, that there's no place that can't grow warm season grass. And with the new varieties of warm season grass, there is no place that has to worry about winter kill from warm season, for warm season grasses from too cold. So keep that in mind. Um, here, one of the other problems with warm season grasses in uh, in temperate climates has always been you could tell if you had a warm season grass yard because in the winter your lawn looks like it's khaki. Uh, warm season grasses, you know, go senescent in the winter, and so they'd be really brown. This is a, a new improved variety of zoysia. Uh, this is winter. That's not exactly khaki. I mean, it's it's not exactly June colors, but it's it's acceptable. And so there are much better selections of warm season grasses available to us now uh, to use, and that can really help us adapt to uh, climate change. Um, there's a national turf grass evaluation program. Kansas is part of it, and uh, you know the, these these are the things where they have these little postage stamp uh, gardens of grass. And they plan it, and it's a beauty contest. The, the people in the turf grass evaluation program go out with a clipboard and they look at which ones are good and they totally revise the list. Um, picking the right one is, you know, that's how you can pick the right one from the list from your turf grass evaluation program. But the other thing to remember is using the, the best BMPs that, you know, the very best pesticide for weeds that exists is a healthy cover crop of what it is that you want to grow. So a really healthy lawn means, you know, having to use less poisons. And so considering that you may have been growing cool season grasses all along, and now they're going to be stressed by a, a cool season, um, by, by it being too warm or by pests that come out in the warmer weather, um, you might consider using a warmer season grass to make your cover be more complete. Okay, uh, for trees. So tree risks are including changes in moisture, changes in pest, uh, not in Kansas, sea level rise, but, uh, but uh, uh, in my neck of the woods, sea level rise is a big deal. Increased storm damage. Now, when these things happen, um, they result in disease. Okay, if there's problems with moisture, then the tree becomes a little bit um, more susceptible to, uh, to damage from pests. Um, there, uh, there are some diseases called sudden death, sudden oak death. We've heard about it. Um, these are things that if your tree is weak, it has less ability to resist these things and, um, and become more uh, di um, diseased. And that makes them into hazard trees. A hazard tree is a tree that's sick enough that if it falls down or calves off a branch, that uh, human injury or damage can occur. And so there can be property damage. Now, this picture here is a picture of sea level rise damage. This is an oak tree. Um, it's next to the water here. The salt water has been flowing up further into this estuary near, uh, this is at the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay, and it eventually um, killed that tree. This is a tree that's next to it. If you look, 
So the salt water, it's not so much that the salt water flows up over here, which of course does happen during some storm events, but salt water is connected to groundwater. And when the salt water gets to the roots of the tree, it starts to cause damage. If you look at this tree on the side of the tree that's exposed to salt water in the groundwater, you can see uh, the grass is ruined. It's not a shade thing because there's plenty of grass on this kind of side of the tree. Um, this is, you know, salt damage to the grass, which shows it earlier. Uh, it, it's caused the tree to start to lose some branches. You can see the damage here. You can see the buildup of the stuff that's fall, fallen off the tree. And you can start to see the, the things that you notice that are um, damage in a tree. The tree within a tree syndrome, that's, you know, where the tree used to grow out to here, and there used to be leaves out there, but now the, the tree's pulling back and the tree, the leaves are closer to held to the main branches. You can see it's happening on this side of the tree. It's not happening on this side of the tree where there's still plenty of fresh water. So if salt water were to be an issue with you, the thing that you could do would be more fresh water irrigation to keep the salt water at bay. That uses more water. You have to have more water to be able to do that. Um, more water is something that might actually be needed. So as, as master gardeners, uh, we're always trained an established tree doesn't really need irrigation. That's incorrect now because uh, an established tree, particularly a tree that's a, a historic tree or of particular interest to you, it's your family's tree, your great grandmother planted the tree, some, some reason that, you know, sentimental value on the tree, you, that tree may require extraordinary effort for you to keep it going. So it may require you to install some type of drip irrigation around it to keep it going during the dry periods, which can become more frequent. Um, it's not something that we can really afford to do in the forests. It's probably not something that we can afford to do in most city parks, unless it is, you know, the hanging tree or the Articles of Confederation tree or some kind of tree like that. It's an important historical point. Um, it might not be pay to do this, but if it's worth saving for some other reasons, then irrigation may be response, be uh, required. You need to start looking for novel pests. Um, one of the things uh, I'm not sure if you guys have seen yet, but the uh, emerald ash borer is a big deal uh, and it's moving around and it's um, when people move wood around from diseased trees, um, it moves the pest around. And so uh, some people move it around, they, you know, move their firewood from, uh, from their house to their camp place or uh, to go visit somebody or sold firewood across county lines. Um, that enables all these pests to move around. In uh, Northern Virginia, um, us master gardeners were the first ones to discover this. I mean, we're out around looking and we said, I don't know that bug. And we looked up that bug and it was emerald ash borer and it was a bad day for everybody. Um, but because those counties would became uh, became quarantined and you couldn't move the wood around. But part of being a master gardener job is to explain that that's not just big government laying on you. That's like all of our woods are at, at risk and, you know, doing the right thing is a good thing to do. So be careful about moving firewood around, look for the damage. And, and actually when the trees start to um, have trouble, you need to remove hazard trees um, and they should be replaced. Trees are an important part for uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. But think about, um, you know, if a tree died in a spot, maybe there's a reason and maybe it needs to be replaced with another variety or species of tree. Okay, there's going to be a novel pests. This is a picture of um, damage from uh, pine bark borers. So pine bark borers can't stand to freeze. And so uh, these, uh, particularly these pine stands in the northern part of our country or higher up the mountainsides in other parts of our country were immune to the pine bark beetle because there would be a freeze in the winter and that would take care of them. Um, if there's a winter without a freeze, then the larvae survive and they can, in the second year, kill the tree. Now this look at these, these are pines. You can see the needles are still on the pines. That's how quickly the pine bark beetle can kill the tree if it gets a toehold. So that's really dangerous because you lost the forest, but that's really, really, really dangerous because of, think of the fire hazard here. This is a, this is like, you know, leaving your Christmas tree standing up in your house 
all year long. Uh, if there's a bolt of lightning here, this is going to be like a fuse to light all of these trees up. And then all of a sudden, these trees are burning so hot that they can light up trees that should be pretty much immune to, to wildfire. So wildfire is a definite damage uh, risk from tree hazards uh, in, in the environment and in your personal uh, ha habitat. This is a, the tree with the in the tree syndrome. You can see there's still some leaves on these branches. This tree is not branched out. This is a tree in my yard. And uh, this is, let me take that back. This is a tree that was in my yard until about a month ago. I realized it was a hazard tree uh, because I looked up and saw this and I was thinking, okay, it's coming. I'm gonna have to do something. And then I saw this, uh, all of the, um, all, all, all of the mushrooms started to branch out on the outside of my tree. That meant that the rot was enough that the tree is in damage here. This is a tree uh, that's very close to my house, which is right there. If it fell, it would cut my tree in half, This my house in half. So this is a hazard tree. It had to come down quickly. And uh, that's the kind of thing that you have to pay attention to. Um, this change in temperatures is going to change our forests. Okay, uh, we are going to be moving from, you know, a, 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 a poplar kind of forest, uh, oak hickory forest uh, into a, an oak pine forest in your neck of the woods. Um, there's going to be much more drastic changes in the northern tier states. Okay, a big change over from uh, maple and beech. If you like maple syrup, it's going to not be coming from New York anymore. It's going to be coming from up in Canada. Okay. okay, the other thing about trees is their ability to help you with climate change. Okay, here's an infrared map from space. The red spots are hot. The green spots are cold. And so look, Washington, D.C. is really hot. Baltimore is really hot. The Chesapeake Bay is water. It's cool. All this is really cool because there are trees there. Um, there's this thing they called urban heat island. And you can actually measure the temperatures around places that are mainly black roofs and black top and, and concrete. Um, they can be, you know, 15 degrees warmer than the, than the suburbs. And what that can mean is, uh, first of all, a heat wave really hits the people in the city harder. Um, and it can build on itself and it can cause a lot of damage. One of the kinds of damage are these things known as uh, gorilla storms. The gorilla storms are... Um, Storms that seem like afternoon storms in the summer, but they happen at the wrong time of day. So, so storms that are from weather, you know, from a front moving across, um, they, they can cause a lot of damage from a front. But non-frontal thunderstorms are the ones that happen, uh, I guess you have them there in uh, Kansas City, in late August when it, it's hot all day and it makes the moisture boil up into the sky. And then after four o'clock, you know, sometime in the afternoon, it, uh, it boils over and it has, and then you have a rainstorm. It can be a violent rainstorm, but it's kind of quick. Um, in, uh, in the mid-Atlantic, I mean, I can set my watch by 4.30. It's going to be raining in the summer because we have high humidity. It boils up and it sets up this non-frontal thunderstorm. But in towns like um, Atlanta or in Tokyo, these frontal storms, these non-frontal thunderstorms can boil up as early as 10 o'clock in the morning. And um, they have much more water in them because the higher temperatures enable much more moisture to be held in the atmosphere so that when uh, the pot boils over and it starts to rain, you can have rainfalls of 100 millimeters an hour, 15 inches an hour. Um, so this is a serious, um, you know, danger issue for flash flooding and for contaminant uh, disturbance or for, uh, you know, if you have a combined, combined sewage outfall situation in your city uh, where the rainwater causes your sewage treatment plant to not work correctly or to overflow. So it's serious. And this is how it works. It, uh, it, the day heats up, uh, the sun heats up the city, moist air is drawn in and it raises up and eventually it reaches the saturation point and it causes the storm. Another problem with this is you could live in the rain shadow. So Atlanta is a city that is growing and they're fighting with Alabama to get more water. Their reservoirs are all in the rain shadow of their town. So the prevailing storms empty all their rain on one side 
and the reservoir is not getting filled because it's on the other side of town. So they're not getting enough water, even though there's enough water, it's not in the place where they can use it. Okay, trees are good. Um, this is a New York City. You can see Central Park. It's dark, it's cooler. You can see the parks in Staten Island. You can see the parks going out Long Island because of the trees that are there. Here's the map of the trees. Here's the map of the temperature. They line up one to one. So they just work in several ways on climate change. One is, you know, you know, stand under a tree, you're cooler. Um, if it's cooler for you, it's cooler for the side of your house. It's cooler for your car. That means you run your car less, you run your air conditioner less. That means you use less fossil fuel. And so that means there's less carbon dioxide emitted. So that's mitigation. But also, if the trees are there, they're absorbing carbon dioxide. And so that's a, like a double hit on taking the fuel, fo fossil fuel generated carbon dioxide out of the air. Okay, so trees can increase soil carbon. So the tree's roots grow and the mycelium that are uh, associated with the roots, the micro mycorrhizae, they all hide carbon. And so that increases pl plant absorption. So it can help you to weatherize your house. It's whole part of the, you know, master gardener mantra, right plant, right place. So, you know, if you live in your house and uh, you plant evergreen trees on the north side of your house, it makes the winter winds fly up over your house and it keys, makes so that you don't have to use quite as much um, um, fuel to keep warm. Uh, likewise, in the summer, if you have deciduous trees on the east and west side, they shade the house and uh, less cooling is required. Um, if you doubt that that's a case, here's an infrared street picture. There's the tree. Here's the cars. The cars are off. And so they're starting to cool down for the night. Here's a tree in front of this house. These, these buildings are all still, they st and the road all still are emitting um, more um, temperature that they stored up all day. And if you look at these nice windows here, you can see that they're not very efficient windows, but it's cool inside because everybody's got the air conditioning set on stun because it's still so hot outside. Okay, there's going to be changes for vegetables in moisture, changes in pests, uh, sea level rise and salinity, and uh, changes in the growing season. Okay, if we look here, you, um, you, you're, you know, likely to be having, um, you know, either a little bit better uh, moisture made to a lot better moisture. Um, Changes in pests, changes in salinity should not be an issue for you, but there's going to be changes in the growing season and in the pests. Um, this is about the number of growing days. And if you can see here, you're, you're like slated to get 10 plus days of growing season, which is great. That means, that means you can grow some stuff you're not used to growing. Think about sweet potatoes. I don't know if you grow them there now, but you sure could. Um, pumpkins that can uh, have, you know, 110 days in your neck of the woods for, for sure. But the pests have a better day, too. So um, having the moisture at the right time is important. This is uh, how much moisture is needed for corn. And uh, you know uh, that you need 15 inches of rain over a year to make, uh, to make corn a good crop. But you can see, you know, you don't need too much in the beginning and you don't want too much in the end when it's drying. But if you don't have enough rain in the week when the tassel forms or when the silk forms, um, then, then you get less of a yield. So thinking about um, growing vegetables, um, these, types, these, these types of graphs are available for almost every vegetable. Uh, if you look hard and around in the extension sites around the country, what you should think about is, do I have enough frost-free days now at the beginning of my growing season to plant here instead of planting here so that I'm not out here where it's guaranteed to be a drought when I need to have the most moisture? Think about that, okay? Think about the pests. In a normal year that we were used to, it would be enough time for one outbreak of the pest. They would have one, uh, uh, you know, one generation. If the growing season gets a little longer or it gets a little warmer, those pests could get bigger and they could cause increased damage. But when the growing season starts to get many days longer, then you get to have extra generations. That means, you know, the plague of locust effect. You get a lot of them growing out. If you have really long days of without, then pests that you shouldn't uh, have seen 
you may start to see more and more and more of. So, so back on turf, army army worm, fall army worm is something that you might be starting to see two crops of or lots more of. Okay. So, um, what are the what are the risk adaptations? Look on the right side. You're going to have more more things to grow. You can grow sweet potatoes. Maybe you can grow winter crops outside now. Um, lettuces, asparagus. Um, I I told you I'm growing artichokes outside now in Virginia, and all of the literature says that can't be done. Um, think about increasing the number of varieties of things you grow. So here's a picture of potatoes. You know, in the Andes where potatoes originally came from. Um, they grow 3,000 varieties of potatoes, and they grow certain kinds on the north slope, certain kinds on the east slope, certain kinds at the higher elevation, certain kinds at the lower elevation near the water. If they get wiped out on any one potato, um, they're okay because they got, you know, 2,000 other varieties to, to choose from. My name is Francis Joseph Brian Riley, Jr. All of my relatives left Ireland the same day, pretty much, because we grew exactly one variety of potato potato famine hit, and we were just out of luck. So uh, ignore all the stories you hear about some of my relatives that left because of missing horses. It was the potatoes. Okay. Um, you should learn about collecting water. You know, you should learn about, you know, supplying more water than you may used to be supplying. In landscaping, the risks are the same. Changes in moisture, changes in pests, changes in the growing season, the cold snaps, hail, down spares. So, you know, here's a pollinator. This is what you'd love to see, cherry blossoms being pollinated. Uh, but we are used to, in this part of the country now to seeing, uh, you know, cold snaps after the warm season, you know, sort of tricks the plants to blooming. And so the, so the, the blossoms can't form cherries um, or the bugs are killed and they cannot do the pollinating. Um, expect um, different kinds of weeds one of the jobs I have been doing was weed control for Customs and Border Protection. This is a weed that grows along the uh, Rio Grande Valley called a Carrizo cane or giant cane. Um, it, uh, it's, a, it's a crop that now is growing farther and farther north in this country. It's, it's so uh, rampant in growth that it's one of the things they're using to, for biofuel. It is a rotten kind of alien invader that we shouldn't allow to grow. And um, the reason I got to grow on it, if you look right here, that's a man standing there. And so it's a public security risk is why I got paid a lot of money to take, take try and eradicate it on the Rio Grande Valley. Um, this is a kind of a grass that uh, I'm sure everybody has tried to grow, um, you know, uh, morning light. Um, these these uh, grasses from China that were supposed to be sterile, if you get three of them together and you have an extra long growing season, they become fertile again and they spread around. So, so this is something to take a look at. Things that used to be safe to grow, maybe no longer safe to grow. Um, you have to worry about things like um, hail damage. I've always been trying to grow gunnera, you know, something in my garden that's a big leaf. Uh, and uh, gunnera won't work for me. I don't know if it works for you. So I came up with this plant, uh, Pedicides. Um, they, they call it wild rhubarb. It's not a rhubarb. Um, it's a really cool big leaf plant. Uh, the dog is not my dog. It's a huge dog. You can see how big the leaves are. The problem is it only throws two flushes of leaves, spring and fall. So when I have hail, Frank, you're breaking up again. Like the rest of the summer. Okay, uh, I have a, a bad internet connection sometimes. So what I suggest is finding some plants that uh, adapt better, like um, hostas. They show hail damage, but they throw leaves all through the summer, and so. So having a large leaf hosta to get your big leaf growing fix in is a better a better plan than something like gunner. Um, so um, manage your drainage. Uh, drainage is going to change. This guy's lawn is getting a little high, but he's doing something else there now. Um, consider what you can do in your garden, in your yard. Um, make your yard a little bumpier so that it can handle moisture in swales for a few days. Consider planting rain gardens to handle the moisture. Um, be prepared for um, wildfire because things like blowdown from storms or ice damage from storms ends up later with a lot of dead fuel load left in the forest. So 
we used to say, you know, it's good to leave that stuff there for habitat for the animals. It's never good enough to leave that much laying on the ground. That is just fuel waiting for fire. So you need to um, harden your home a little bit about it. And there's a thing called firewise landscaping that I'd love to talk to you sometime about. But the idea there is to make places around your home that retards the fire before it gets to your house. Um, because fire runs along the ground and then climbs up shrubberies and into trees and then can jump onto your house. This is a typical kind of planting. And, you know, there would be my front door right there. Um, this is perfect for wildfire. Using foundation plantings is old fashioned gardening uh, from the Victorian era when their houses were perched up higher. Our houses aren't really built that way these days anymore, but this is left around to handle that. And I, you know, I think you should consider the fact that a wildfire in grass can burn along here and then get into this um, evergreen and grow up. And the next thing you know, it's be able to touch my roof. And so avoid the fuel ladders in the landscape. That's a good way to be worried about wildfire. Um, you know, keep your yard cleaned up of de debris. Keep the gutters cleaned up. Make sure the spark arrestor is, is here because climate change means there's more fuel around and you need to manage that fuel um, to avoid the increased number of storms that have increased lightning. So, so if you manage it, you can react to these things much, much more positively. Um, vote. So when I say vote, uh, here's what some, uh, master, some master gardeners got going in a town near us, Lynchburg. This is a highway cloverleaf. You know, every summer, uh, the Department of Transportation is out here mowing. Um, it's ugly. It's a lot of grass. It's hot. Um, it uses a lot of fossil fuel. They came up with the idea of um, making deals with the, with the gardeners in the neighborhood, garden clubs, master gardeners, and businesses to sponsor it. That's, this is the exact same spot I showed you in the last picture. They've put in trees for shade. The trees also capture carbon in their biomass. They capture carbon under the ground. Um, they put in low-growing woodies because one of the things is um, you have to be able to see in a cloverleaf. That's why they had to mow so much. They don't have to mow here now. These are not going to, you know, their varieties are selected so that they're not going to grow tall enough to obstruct view. Um, and here there is still some turf there because it's just hard to break the habit for some people. But um, there's far less mowing going on here. And actually, if they let this grass grow, overgrow, it's not part of the sight line problem anymore. So they could get away with not mowing it. So less fossil fuel use. So less fossil fuel used and more carbon dioxide sequestered. Um, green roofs is a thing. I, I live near DC. You can't go around DC now without seeing a demonstration green roof. And I just love seeing this one. That's one. Who's got it? And they're telling us there is such thing as climate change, but they are mitigating it. Um, trees, street trees are an important thing. They have, you know, people say, oh, that's just an expense. Actually, they save everybody money by carbon dioxide reduction. They save everybody money by energy savings. They save uh, health by air quality improvement. Of course, they make it look better. They, um, street trees decrease crime. Um, it's been shown, it's been measured. And street trees keep your car's paint from baking off. So they, you know, a, 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 a tree on a street is probably worth $53,000 in savings to the community a year. So these are the kind of points you make when you go to the city council meeting or the, co or the county uh, supervisors meeting and say, we, we should plant some trees. Okay, I would like it if you could help me out. Uh, I'm a master gardener and I'm trying to get master gardener out to more people. Uh, and I want to have, you know, some input from master gardeners. So I, uh, I have this web page in association with some friends of mine at the Water Citizen Foundation um, that if you if you go there and um, and and fill in the blank, I it's going to be coming to me. So I'm not selling the list to anybody. Uh, but I guarantee you, you'll get either an email or a call from me asking you some questions because I'm developing a survey to, you know, see what it would be that would help you with what you do uh, and what would help you uh, explain better to the citizens. So the address is uh, watercitizen.org 
front slash climate smart. And I'll put it in the chat box too, so you can copy it right down. And now, if you're interested, I'll take some questions. I think you did an excellent job of explaining everything. We haven't had very many questions come in. But Gail so Bergman, <laughs> Gail Bergman from uh, the air quality, she's the air quality supervisor at Unified Government Health Department, says that one endeavor we will be pursuing is replacing some turf grass with native plant landscaping. Would love your input or support in that endeavor, especially as we try to sell it to our parks and recreation department as a positive change. And then of course, she's asking for input from our master gardeners. Have any advice for her on dealing with parks and recreation? I do. Uh, so the, the thing to point at, to try not to be so zealous about it and and try to be factual about it. Um, the slide I just showed, I want to go back to it. So there are a number of things like this that are available for things other than um, other than trees. Trees are good. Shrub, um, the, the tree people are really good about putting this out, but uh, shrub people um, have it out there too. The thing with natives that you can point out is, um, you know, the expense, uh, the initial expense, the initial expense of installing native plants is kind of high because uh, because it's it's not a commodity type of a crop. They're not just out there. You have to find you know smaller growers to supply them for you, and they cost more. They're not just turf grass. But right away, uh, you don't have to mow them, or maybe you only have to mow them. Uh, it depends on you know what you put in, but uh, you might have to mow them just annually to keep. Uh, trees from growing up in it if that's what you want. Uh, the master gardeners are a good source for that kind of information and yeah, your local um, native plant societies, the only thing I'll warn you about is the native plant societies are oftentimes so zealous that they, you know, are too cool for school when it comes time to explaining um, why it really is good to do it. You know, they're it's not that it's better to do it in their case, it's that it's the only way to do it. And that just never floats with, uh, with county supervisors. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, what about tree placement in the suburbs? Uh, this lady says, my north side is my neighbor's south side and my evergreens may not help overall because of their effect on my, my neighbor. How do we add that into the calculation of where we plant trees? Uh, go say that again. Okay. Uh, this lady says that her north side of her property is her neighbor's south side of his property. So uh, how do you take into effect where to plant trees so that you can benefit your own property without taking away from your neighbor's property? Uh, that's a good. That's a good question, and it de it depends on the amount of space between the property lines. Uh, uh, it's best to have your trees a certain distance from your house for it to work for you. Um, look, look it up. That that those pictures I showed are all over the internet, and it gives you a specific number of feet to make it work for the height of your house. So if you're going to do it. Um, you know, is your yard big enough that you planting the trees will help you? Uh, if not, then then don't. And then if and then you, that's that's wonderful of you to think of your neighbor. If you do it, is it going to mean that um, you're ruining their southern and warming exposure in the winter uh, by you putting in your trees? And so, uh, yeah, measure it out and then and then make a good neighbor decision. Uh, Frank, we've had a request. Could you put up the slide again of house and fire protection? Okay. Uh, let's see. I think this is a better one. This one? There. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. So the idea here, this is a, this is a nation. What's that? Also Deborah, one, what? Also the one before it. I had the picture of the house and... It's colorful. There's a lot yeah. of information uh, available about this now. Uh, one of the books I wrote as a master gardener uh, 
uh, it was funded by National Park Service because they were interested in uh, getting master gardeners to talk about composting. Uh, because master gardener, because people live at the edge of national forests and throw all their yard debris, you know, over the fence into the forest, which increases the fuel load. Um, like like any good grant recipient, I ignored what they wanted and did what I wanted, and put together this stuff. Um, I didn't invent it, but um, I adapted it for use for master gardeners. Uh, 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 fire wise landscaping. And that's what the concepts here are. Uh, the idea is, uh, you know, people are moving into the wildlands a lot and they don't really know how to live there. It's not the same as living in Levittown. Uh, and so, so things that you can do around your house to um, both, uh, you know, prepare yourself um, for fire that's in the neighborhood, but also prepare yourself to not be the one who caused the fire in the neighborhood. Um, it it doesn't take you know leaves in the gutters is a pain in the neck, uh, but uh, but a spark getting into the leaves in the gutters makes them smolder and burn until they catch, and then you have asphalt shingles or maybe even have uh, cedar shakes. That's then all of a sudden you know your roof's on fire. So so cleaning out the gutters is an important thing to do. Um, gardening so that you're so that you're you know so that you're the, the places that you can't control, if you are close to the wildlands, up against the state park or the national park or a park um, where there is a lot of fuel load because of stuff that blew down, don't throw your stuff in there. But also, that might be the side of the yard for you to best put in more turf because turf is really good at slowing down and advancing fire. And so, you know, or maybe that's the place to put in... Uh, a retaining wall because, uh, you know, burn up to the base of a retaining wall uh, of stone and then not be able to jump up onto your yard. So you can think of those kind of tricks and there's there's lots and lots of tricks about that. And if you'd like some time, I'll come back and talk to you about that. I, I have a lot of stuff about that. Yeah, I think one of the things that I have noted recently, I have a lot of friends in South and Southwest Kansas um, the wildfires in the panhandle of Oklahoma and southern Kansas have become a great concern. In fact, they've already started this year. Uh, there was a fire the other day out by Protection, Kansas. And so I think we tend to think that the fires aren't going to get us in Kansas City because we get more water, we... Uh, we don't have a lot of grassland, but at the same time, if the, if the drought continues, we could very well see um, fires starting to come closer to Kansas City. Is my thinking correct? You don't know how correct it is. It's perfectly on, on par. So I didn't show you this, but in some of my day job work that I did for Department of Defense was... Uh, was, um, you know, what, what are the climate change impacts for uh, various places where they make important stuff? And some important stuff happens to be made pretty close to where you are. And um, we found um, that wildfire, according to the climate models, wildfire increased um, severity and increased frequency um, are highly predicted to increase through the end of the century for your exact neighborhood. So, so doing this kind of stuff is not just singing through my hat. It's it's really predicted to occur. You have to look at the neighborhood. If you if you're in a neighborhood that's you know surrounded by neighborhoods, um, your risk is a little smaller. Uh, if you live at the edge, your risk is very high. If you think you live in a safe spot. But it's um, I don't know you know it's public a public park for example that the city fathers have uh, neglected to pay for the mowing enough so that all instead of like you know turf grass now it's like knee high grass uh, in the winter or it's high grass we're not mowing because it's uh, because it's droughty 
well, that's brown, dry grass. I mean, I could throw a cigarette butt in there and, and you know, get that whole field to start up. And although you think you live safely in the middle of town, all of a sudden you got fuel load right by you. So, you know, keeping your eyes open as to what's around you is important. And you are in a neighborhood where you should do it. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, that looks like that's it. Uh, Frank, thank you so very much for doing this for us. We've got quite a few com uh, comments that uh, excellent presentation and we do have a couple of requests for Firewise landscaping class. So if there is nothing else uh, from anyone, uh, I think we're done. Thank you. Um.